so it's one it's eleven o'clock here in BC now, so we'll get started. And welcome to the NCCH Healthy Built Environment Forum webinar. This is the second webinar in the series, uh, which just started last year, late last year. Thank you all for joining us. We had um, a really great response to this webinar. Uh, my name is Tina Chen. I am a knowledge translation scientist at the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health. Today, we're very excited to have Diane Oiko, a knowledge translation specialist at the National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health, and Karen Rideout, the principal of Karen Rideout Consulting Firm, to present and facilitate our webinar on supporting health equity through a healthy built environment. So because there's so many of you online, to avoid any background noise and disruptions, we will be muting everyone's phones. Um, during the presentation and discussion portion, please enter your questions and comments into the chat box at the lower right-hand side of the window. You can also respond to each other and uh, talk to each other in the chat box, and we will address your questions or engage with you verbally. Again, please mute your phones and please contribute via the chat box. So now over to you, Diana and Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. Um, so it's Karen here. So great to have such a large group um, expressing interest in this topic. So I think Diana and I are both really happy to see that. And um, a number of people have been introducing yourself in the chat box, so I'll encourage you to keep doing that. Let us know who's out there, where you're from, and um, anything else about your role or the organization that you work in. Um, and we'll, that'll help give us a good sense of who's on the line. Um, Oh, so before I get started, I'll um, just to acknowledge the lands that we're on. Um, the BCCDC here in Vancouver is located on the unceded Indigenous land of the Coast Salish people. Hi, and it's and Diane here. Oh, sorry, Karen. Carry on. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. And um, <clears throat> so it, we're on two different coasts. Karen is there in Vancouver, and I'm calling from Antigonish, Nova Scotia, and we are at St. Francis Xavier University, um, the NCCDH, and that is located in Mi'kmaq, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, and it's very important for both of our organizations that we've um, acknowledged the land that we are um, settler guests upon, and um, we're both very grateful to be here. Go ahead, Karen. Thanks, Diane. Um, so today we've got an hour set aside for this forum, and the first half uh, we'll spend 30 minutes giving uh, Diane and I will be presenting a bit of background information about the built environment, health equity, and then sort of some of the intersections between how those two concepts fit together. And then we're going to give an overview of a, a health equity and the built environment fact sheet and share some real life examples from practice just in brief to help stimulate some conversation and ideas about how um, you can all implement some of these ideas in your own work. And then the second half will be a 30 minute question and answer time just to clarify any concepts that came up during our presentation and we'll have an, an interactive, we're calling it a discussion, but we'll do it through the through the chat box because of um, the numbers of people out there. And um, we've posted also a list of additional resources on the forum page, which you should be able to access. And we'll also encourage you to, you know, anytime throughout the presentation to add links uh, to any additional resources that you might like to share with the group. So I'll pass it over to Diane to get started. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Um, so my job today is to introduce um, some of the main concepts that we're talking about during the webinar. And then um, Karen is going to dive into some of the tools that are available to um, address them. And so as you all know, a focus of the webinar today is healthy built environments and health equity. And, you know, what is the intersection of those concepts? How how can um, addressing health equity be built into our work on healthy built environments? Um, we, Karen and I talk about that a lot, about how health equity is is a build-in to the public health work that we do. We're trying not to think of it as an add-on. It's a build-in. It's a, it's a frame. It's a lens with which we approach our public health work. So, you know, in order to figure that out, we really have to step back and look at what, you know, what we mean by built environment um, and how that applies to public health. And so the environment 
you know, we hear that word a lot when we talk about the environment. It's more than just where our health outcomes are obtained or where they're received. Um, you know, the environment where we live impacts every aspect of our lives, um, including our genetics, and our psychology, our physical surroundings, our personal practices. The built environment is uh, made up of physical and man-made things but it's also made up of natural components as well. So it's more, you know, sometimes when we hear built environment, we hear, we think buildings and structures and high rises, and it's so much more than those things that are, you know, quote unquote built. And it's so much more than, you know, buildings and pavement that surrounds us. The built environment is really a composition of structures and space that, you know, things that are man-made, but combined to things that are natural spaces that naturally occur or influenced by human construction and, and then all those systems that operate um, within that and that are created by that. And so if we go to the next slide, um, we look at, you know, what is a healthy built environment? So the built and the natural environments together um, are what we refer to as physical environments. Physical surroundings, which way we live, um, that shape our lives, that shape um, our communities and our geographies. Um, and this is sort of just another way to think about those concepts of what environments are. The physical environment is really intricately linked with the social environment. And we, we often forget about that social environment when we're talking about our built environment and our environmental public health work. Um, social environment is those social relationships and the cultural settings that occur within those physical surroundings. And it includes social and economic processes, beliefs about place and community, um, other influences such as income, race, social supports, cultural practices, community connectedness, and the power relations that go along with all of that. So we also, we always need to consider the social environment in any discussions that we have about built environment. Social is part of the built. Um, it's influenced by the built, and it also has an influence over the built environment. And so addressing the health of the social environment is part of all this public health work. So all of that is to say that a healthy built environment is more, you know, than just the sum of those parts. Um, it's when each of those individual parts are healthy in and of themselves. And then it's only when they intersect in ways that allow health to flourish does it become a healthy built environment. Each part alone is a healthy built environment. So if we do work on um, healthy neighborhood design, for example, that isn't all of healthy built environments. It's also not all of health equity. Um, it's the interaction of those features of healthy built environments that actually create it. And, and I know Karen's gonna get further into that as we go. So if we go to the next slide, we then look at the concepts of what health equity is. And this is the definition that um, our National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health offers in our glossary of essential health terms, which is linked um, on the screen, and you can find it on our website. And you know, when we when we consider what we mean by health equity, what's important to remember is that you know there's a real judgment of value, um, a value component to this concept of health equity and inequity. It's something that's unfair. It's un it's avoidable, it's modifiable. So in other words, we can do something about it and then we should do something about it. Um, we can modify something in some way to influence the health outcomes that are associated with equity and inequities. So, you know, genetics are not necessarily modifiable. I mean, that certainly they are from a long-term perspective, but when you're dealing with an, an individual um, or a community in front of you, the, the genetics are not immediately modifiable. Um, but the physical and natural components of the built environment are modifiable. And how they interact and influence the social environment is also modifiable. And so for this reason, health equity and inequity are not just outcomes of the built environment that happen no matter what we do, the built environment can be modified, it can be changed and constructed so that inequities in health that are experienced by groups that have been you know, subject to marginalization um, by structures and environments that surround them can then also be, be switched and can be modified. So if we go to the next slide, we want to explore a little bit the concepts of um, equality and equity. And 
I know that a lot of people have seen that picture of the kids standing at the fence um, on different boxes and different numbers of, numbers of boxes that bring them up to a different level. And this is a graphic I found. Um, I've given the website link there, so um, credit goes to that source. This is not my graphic, and I in no way pretend <laughs> to for it to be mine. Um, this is was just a really good graphic that um, spoke to these concepts and how they relate to healthy built environments. So, you know, if we know equality and equity are not the same thing. Um, advocating for equality in built environments would mean ensuring, you know, so equality. It would mean ensuring that all communities had the same amount of resources per citizen. Um, but on the other hand, advocating for equity would mean really recognizing that some communities, you know, like those who serve people living on a low income, um, communities of color, um, communities that are built um, in and around substandard housing, they will actually need more resources, funding, um, financial, but also community-based resources, infrastructures, if we're even going to make a dent in the health disparities that result from living in substandard conditions that are created by marginalization. So if we give the same to every community to give them an equal chance, that would assume that every community starts out at the same place. And we know that they don't. And so that, that's what we mean by this graphic is that there are some communities that start off in a position um, of less health and of being a less healthy built environment and they actually may need more resources to bring them to a level where their residents have an equal chance at health um, as residents that happen to be in the neighborhood that's already um, more healthy and built more healthy. So hopefully that resonates and hopefully that um, helps marry the concepts of um, build environment and health equity um, with you. And so with that, I will turn it over to Karen and she's going to continue with some specific resources that are available. Thanks, Diane. Um, so yeah, I'm going to move from that um, great introduction into um, really a, a summary and overview based largely on this resource that you see on the screen, this fact sheet of supporting health equity through the built environment. Um, and this was designed to be a companion to the Healthy Built Environment Linkages Toolkit, which was the focus of the last webinar in this forum. And so it's organized in a very similar way, and you'll see that if you flip through the two documents. Um, and this particular fact sheet is really to give some principles as you work through um, work around trying to create healthier built environments to bring in that equity lens throughout the different aspects of the built environment. Um, so this resource was developed based on uh, a literature review that was done by Tara Zipanchik and Claire Westmacott a few years ago now. Um, so there may be some more up-to-date research that will be be great to maybe bring in some of that during the discussion time. And at the time they did this review, um, a lot of the research focused on disadvantaged neighborhoods and socioeconomic status, and they really didn't find a lot specific to healthy built environment and um, particular vulnerable populations. So um, we'll try to bring that in as much as we can um, in addition to some of the evidence that we were able to review. And kind of the main message of this fact sheet is really to point out that um, you know, on the one hand, healthy built environment work is a really great opportunity to support health equity because when you improve access to health supportive environments, everyone in the community theoretically has, um, you know, has access to those changes and the impacts could be felt across the community. However, um, as Diane alluded to, we have to be really careful about not um, equating health equity work with healthy built environment work because if you're not, um, very careful about how you make changes in neighborhoods, you can actually exacerbate inequities that might exist there. So it's very important to ensure that those efforts actually do meet the needs of the specific population in a community and particularly that they consider the needs of, of vulnerable uh, populations or populations with specific needs and, and that those populations are involved in some of the planning and decision making processes. So. Um, there's a couple of overarching guiding principles in the start of this resource that can be really thought about across any of the areas of, of built environment. So whether you're looking at changes to housing, food systems, transportation networks, neighborhood design, um, these two principles that are up here are really something that 
we encourage you to think about um, no matter what aspect of built environment work you are doing. Um, in general, what this means is that um, it's important to consider that the any changes in opportunities or any interventions done are that people have equitable access and equitable opportunity to take advantage of those changes. Um, so the first principle is to create opportunities for vulnerable or priority populations to participate in the planning and decision making processes. And, and so that's really meaning community involvement in the planning process. And that's particularly important when you have communities with vulnerable populations because those community members are the people who are the best equipped to both identify what kind of barriers they're facing to accessing the services that are available, identifying the sources of inequities, and also identifying what actions need to be done to change um, to change some of those issues and, and improve it. And then so that leads into the second uh, guiding principle of considering the unique needs of those vulnerable populations when you put plans into place. So this gets at that idea that you know interventions that aren't responsive to the unique needs or barriers of particular groups or populations could exacerbate existing health inequities. Um, but if you do, you know, if you incorporate things like health equity impact assessments or just a lot of community engagement into those planning processes, hopefully um, you can come up with uh, ideas and plans that will not only avoid exacerbating any of those issues, but will also address some of the inequities that might be existing already. So I'm going to go through now each of the five um, physical features and, or, from the uh, Healthy Built Environment Linkages Toolkit and, and discuss some of the equity principles that you could layer on when you're working in each of those areas. So the first is neighborhood design. And neighborhood renewal or neighborhood design changes in particular um, are important to consider health equity because this is an area that really can result in unintended health inequities if you don't take into account the local context and the needs of the particular populations in a community. Um, so really thinking about fully accessible um, changes or interventions in, in neighborhood designs. So one of the first principles is really to, one, because lower socioeconomic status neighborhoods um, tend to have the least amount of services that might support healthy living and, and health, overall it's really important to prioritize those neighborhoods when when engaging in, in healthy built environment changes, but also when you're doing that to make sure that that's done in a way that does not displace people. So, um, for example, you know, uh, replacing some rundown housing with a really fantastic community center um, is great in some ways, but of course there's a risk then of displacing people who lived in that housing and what do they do in the meantime and, and will they then be able to access housing back in that community. So it's just that it's that balance between improvements and preventing uh, displacement or gentrification that's done in a way that doesn't necessarily serve the needs of the local community. So it's, it's really a lot about balance and that collaborative process for planning and implementation of changes to make sure that, that things work for the community and, and taking a really comprehensive approach. So if we move on to um, transportation, uh, transportation is something that's really important to consider from an equity perspective, um, mainly because public transportation and to some extent active transportation is particularly important for people with uh, mobility challenges or low incomes because they might depend on um, you know, these non, you know, transportation that doesn't require having an own personal automobile, you know, and they need it to get to their jobs, to do their shopping, get the kids to school, and, and go to appointments, all the, you know, sort of daily necessities of, of getting around their community. Um, so, to, to take an equity lens to that work, I, I think one way to think of it is to consider the different publics that might be in a community and who uses what kind of transportation and why are they using that. So does your community have people with mobility issues that need accessible public transportation? Um, if there's you're putting in active transportation networks, um, you know, are those actually serving the needs of the community and you know, do those work for um, the circumstances of people in the community. So prioritizing both safety, uh, enjoyment, and also the type of transportation. And then also thinking about 
um, the daily activity flows of the people who are depending on different kinds of transportation, making sure that they actually do connect to where people need to go on a daily basis. And of course, these are things that you would, you know, would be considered in, in any healthy built environment work, but just to take that extra consideration of the, uh, the local subpopulations when you're uh, putting an equity lens onto it. Uh, and then, so the next uh, area is natural environments, and this really takes two kind of aspects. One is sort of the greenness or the amount of natural space that's available, and then the other piece of it relates to the kind of exposures that people have um, that are related to their natural environment. So there's a lot of evidence that socioeconomically disadvantaged people um, tend to live in areas that are more deprived, might have greater environmental burdens from, you know, air quality or other toxins or pollution, and also have poor access to the environmental amenities that support health, such as parks and, and really nice green spaces. And they may have less resilience when they are exposed to environmental hazards and less ability to actually um, get treatment or, or other supports to deal with those exposures. So a lot of kind of overlapping issues going on. Um, on the other hand, there's really strong evidence and growing that access to green space actually does have a greater health impact um, on people who are living with low socioeconomic status than they do for the for the general population. So there's a really good opportunity there by influencing um, green and natural environments in underserved neighborhoods to have a, an even bigger health effect um, when you're looking at potentially disadvantaged populations. So kind of two main principles to think about are to expand and improve diverse forms of both accessible and connected green spaces in underserved areas. And this supports both physical health and social and mental health. Um, and then also to integrate strategies that address exposure to environmental hazard, hazards, whether that be poor air quality, vulnerability to extreme heat, safety issues, um, chemical and biological pollution, um, and all these things that often do tend to coexist in in more disadvantaged neighborhoods. So to pay particular attention to those when you're um, taking an equity perspective. And uh, so then moving on to food systems, the fourth area of uh, the linkages toolkit. Um, and food systems are important to think about. I know they're not as directly related to the you know, quote unquote, built environment per se, but but they are quite linked in to aspects of the built environment. And food is important from an equity perspective, largely because people often really struggle to balance their food expenditures with other costs related to housing, transportation, and other necessities. So it's really close, you know, food security and food insecurity become really important here. Um, so uh, planning issues around food systems can focus on having the infrastructure and the zoning and planning that will facilitate access to healthy and affordable food options near where people live and work and where they can, can get around through public transit connections, um, looking at a range of food programs to support that community self-reliance. Um, so things like community gardens and community kitchens and, and infrastructure support programming like that for the local communities. Um, and then also, you know, different communities have different food needs. So particularly in rural areas or where there are indigenous communities, ensuring that um, you know, the planning processes provide access to those unique food needs of those populations. And then the final one that I have here is, is amenities to minimize food waste. And, and this is a, taking a little bit more of a global perspective because, um, you know, what, re reducing and preventing food waste overall is, is really important on a longer term and a broader scale to, um, you know, minimize environmental impact and improve the affordability of food systems. And then the final area um, that's addressed in the Linkages Toolkit that we focus on in this um, fact sheet is housing, and um, you know certainly access to housing is is an important built environment issue that relates to equity and, and income in particular. Um, there's strong evidence that local or low socioeconomic status is associated with poor quality housing, um, as well as with crowding and increased exposure to environmental risks inside and outside the home. So housing that's located nearer um, potentially hazardous environmental exposures. Um, and then also housing that's maybe more susceptible to dampness, mold, or a lack of thermal comfort, um, or located closer to um, 
uh, busy roadways so that you get more traffic pollution or noise and other industrial pollution. So a lot of kind of issues that also relate to transportation and neighborhood design for sure. Um, so important to ensure that, um, again, neighborhood renewal strategies are planned in tandem with affordable housing and access to services. Um, to make sure that people, again, are not displaced from housing while you're, you know, putting effort into improving the quality of housing. And then when affordable housing is built, to really make sure that there is a focus on quality so that it's easier to maintain and that things can be retrofitted to ensure that thermal comfort and prevention of, of issues related to mold or safety. Um, dampness and things like that inside the house. And then another area related to housing um, that could be particularly related to health equity is radon um, because a lot of lower income people will live in the basements and lower areas of houses because these do tend to be more affordable apartments. Uh, but these are also the areas if you do have a, you know, if you're in a high radon geographic area, it's the basements and the lower levels of houses that actually have higher radon exposure. So if you have young children or people who spend a lot of time at home living in the lower areas of houses, then, then radon can become a very important uh, health equity issue as well. And of course, housing is closely related to food insecurity as well. So stability of housing and housing that supports the uh, people's ability to um, both access and, and use the food they have, um, partly related to, you know, competition for income, but also in terms of just the, the facilities that people have access to. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Diane to um, go through um, a brief example of uh, from Saskatoon about putting actually putting some of these health equity concepts into practice. Thanks, Karen. Um, and really, what I'm going to, to do with this is highlight um, where people can get more information on this work. So recently, we um, <clears throat> published a blog, and the link is there. Um, to highlight some examples of healthy built environment related work happening in Saskatoon. And it's work that intentionally has health equity strategies built into it. Um, the Saskatoon Poverty Reduction Strategy um, is a cross sectoral um, partnership and initiative which intentionally engages with citizens um, to help develop, um, inform how the strategy itself is developed and then also inform which solutions should be considered as part of the strategy. So um, it, that concept of engaging with um, citizens who have, sometimes we call, we refer to citizens or people with lived experience. Um, most recently, I had a deep discussion with a group around changing that and shifting that to people who have um, grounded expertise uh, in living with those social determinants. and and. For some, in some situations, it, 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 that term, grounded expertise, um, adds a real legitimacy to the type of knowledge uh, and expertise that they, the citizens do bring to the table. So um, intentionally engaging with citizens who have grounded expertise in living in built environments that are not healthy um, and therefore um, experience the inequities that, as the result um, is important. And they have this this poverty reduction strategy has done some connection um, to healthy built environments, um, including you know areas of transportation, housing, homelessness, food security, aspects of social and physical environments. So it's it's that integration of that you know poverty reduction strategies, for example, can happen in tandem with healthy built environment work. They don't happen in silos alongside. Um, the other piece that this work in Saskatoon is doing is. Um, including the first voice, um, and they've created, um, a, uh, I've got it in my hand here, uh, a manual, a guide, sorry, a resource that's called Creating a Culture of Inclusion. And um, there's a link to that resource on the blog link here. And this is a guide that um, has been created to support the engagement of people who have that grounded expertise of poverty in work that is done on their behalf. So essentially nothing about us without us. Um, and the Saskatoon Poverty Reduction Partnership works to include this in developing its strategy for the built environments and, and the poverty reduction. So, um, you know, Saskatoon, the Saskatoon people are the experts on that work. Um, I wanted to just offer that as an example that we know of and certainly you can uh, connect with us for more information. Karen? 
Thanks, Diane. And then bef just before we go into the discussion, I'm going to share one other brief example. And I think there might be a few people on the line who were involved in this process, so I'm going to encourage you to weigh in with more information in the chat box. But I just wanted to highlight um, a, a official community plan process that happened in the District of North Vancouver, just across the water from where we are here. And this was a two-year public engagement and awareness process and involved a, a memorandum of understanding between the District of North Vancouver and the local health authority of Vancouver Coastal Health and, and to put a health lens to the whole community planning process. Um, what I was really struck by with this process, which is there's a story written about it on the link there um, on the Plan H website, which you can get a bit more information. But they engaged over 5,000 people in the local community um, to both identify and then work to address some of the specific needs of the different um, people living within that community. So what that meant was that that engagement process allowed them to look at what were the specific housing needs that they needed to incorporate into the plan. They had an aging population. They were able to focus on sustainability and inclusivity of, of different groups within the community, deal with some of the food security issues that people were were facing with, respond to the needs of the local First Nations communities. Um, they also engaged with a number of different community groups. Um, they worked with the Heart and Stroke Foundation and a few others to really get a more complete picture of what some of the issues were and then try to work some solutions to those issues into the community plan and, and I think come up with a plan that um, really reflected the the needs and the desires and the realities of, of the people living within that community. And I'll leave it at that, um, but um, if people do want to give a bit more detail about that one in the chat box, if, if you were involved in that, I encourage you to do that. And so with that, I think we are, are done our presentation area uh, time. We would like to have a brief few minutes to just answer any specific questions about what Diane and I have both presented so far and and then move right into some discussion about and, and answer some of those questions. So I'm going to pull up the chat window just for in room participants and I'll see what's been happening in the chat box. So because we have over 140 people online, um, we decided to do to only allow discussions in the chat box, just uh, avoiding any noises and whatnot. So, um, I think a couple of questions that I <coughs> saw. So, the first one, many neighborhoods benefit from active community voices and skilled political engagement in gaining increased services. For example, um, improved transportation, mm -hmm. Schools, bike lanes, traffic calming. Often these are neighborhoods with higher social economic status. How do you address this? I'll take a stab <laughs> at that. Um, that's a great question, and you know, and I think it raises that important point that it is often the more, um, you know, the people with more advantage who have sometimes have an ability or feel they have an ability to have a louder voice, and and we all know, you know, that that uh, phrase of, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, and I think what that highlights for me is that how important it is to actually actively engage um, different populations within a community. And so not just, you know, putting something out there and letting people come to you and give their ideas, but actually going out and asking the community directly and, and being very proactive in engaging the whole community and not just the people who, who have a stronger voice. And I, and I think, and, um, I think it building on that, it's, um, it's that in intentional, um, prioritization to engage with that community that has grounded expertise living, um, in, in circumstances that, um, you know, have caused them disadvantage. So, you know, a lot of public health organizations, for example, are developing um, community engagement frameworks or strategies. Um, the the document that I link we link to through that Saskatoon blog, creating a culture of inclusion, is about um, how organizations can build into their regular everyday work. Um, 
drawing on their communities to inform what their priorities should be and um, providing a space for that engagement and inclusion, but um, more than just providing a space, doing it where it's meaningful, um, not tokenism, not intentional. And I think that that, um, that is the going to be one of the best ways um, for um, uh, communities that have been marginalized to have a voice. I think, too, um, and someone made this comment in the chat box that, um, you know, if, if um, organizations who represent um, those populations that may have been marginalized, um, those organizations are advocating on their behalf. Um, that's also another big role. Tina, is there others? Um, yeah, I think we have one comment from the room. Would you, I yeah, think? Yeah. Uh, can we actually, just... it's a very nice talk. The problem with this type of uh, information, while it's very widespread and, and cover many issues, is that, for example, language is not coming up. Now, it, this is a very important issue. I, ideally, I would like to see that there is a subtitle of language as the five categories, the sex category, because first of all, the number of people who are involved is enormous. 40% of the population of uh, Richmond, for example, were not born inside country. Also, it could be addressed very easily by translation, by you know some information. Let's assume the uh, new Canadian food guide came up um, a couple of days ago. So until the Chinese-speaking people will reach to that you know point to be familiar with, it takes long you know far ahead. So we have a question from online that um, I wanted to bring up. Um, so there's an absence of community planning, public health strategies on enhancing the experience of the individual who is living with chronic in invisible illness. In what ways are public health planners, landscape architects working to engage these communities to understand the unique needs of these individuals? Um, are there individuals who are researching this perspective that you're aware of? Um, Again, a great question, and and I noticed there's a follow-up question about you know asking what was meant by chronic invisible illness. Um, and Kendra, you know, feel free to add to that. My interpretation of that would be something you know things like maybe mental illness or diabetes, Lyme disease, um, Lyme disease pain. Yeah, okay. So the things that that you can't visually see from from the outside. Um, yeah, and I think that's a challenge in, in many areas, you know, built environment just being one of them. I'm not aware of any particular um, research on this. Um, I'm not sure if you are, Diane. I know around mental illness, I will say that we're actually in the process. Um, I'm working with Tannis Cheadle, who I believe is on the line, uh, and we're working with BCCDC to do another companion piece to the Healthy Built Environment Linkages Toolkit focused on mental health and, and community planning. Um, so that should be coming out within the next few months or later later this year sometime. Um, so that's one particular piece of it, but that certainly doesn't address that across across everything. Um, There's anyone in the audience? Go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I certainly encourage people to put resources, if you know of any, in the chat box. Right. Yeah, yeah, please do. So I'm... Um, I have a little bit of awareness of some research, <laughs> um, mostly from a, um, a project that our MCCs did a couple of years ago now, the Population Mental Health Project. Um, now it, the research that I became aware of in that was specific to mental health and um, built environments, physical and natural environments and what that intersection is. And in a few minutes, um, I will put the link up in the chat box for people to access those resources. Um, and I realize that's not um, the, the fullness of the question that's here. Um, you know, I know of, and I don't know if this is exactly answering the question, but I do know that there are some health units um, in Ontario, for example, where um, some of the public health employees are working with um, municipal planners um, around um, where to place trees for shade 
um, and doing assessments, um, health equity impact assessments on various communities um, and trying to assess where um, to plant trees to create extra shade as a protective mechanism to um, some of the hot days and the heat mornings that many parts of the country often experience. And, you know, um, also then considering which community, you know, in what, <clears throat> in what communities would it make um, a bigger difference to those communities that are at higher risk, you know, to those groups that are at, um, have been marginalized, for example. So a lot of communities that have substandard housing also don't have great green spaces that provide protection from the heat. They also don't live in houses that have air conditioning, and so those those communities are at greater risk. So there are pieces like that um, that are happening, and I don't know if that's exactly what um, you're looking for, but um, I also know that there are places where there's public health is is interacting with private businesses like um, landscape architects and um, landscape companies, for example. I don't know if that helps. Thanks, Diane. There are a few good questions that came up in the chat box, but I think we're going to move on to the discussion questions first. Sure. Yeah, yeah. and then we can come, back, yeah, to, we can come um, back to some more of the questions that are popping up there. So please keep adding them in. Um, sure. So, yeah, so I'm just going to move us ahead here and trying to move slide. Um <laughs> We wanted to get a sense of who um, who the different vulnerable groups are that people on the line are working with. So we've put up a partial list. Um, certainly, one that is I see now is is missing. There are you know people who don't have English as their first language or don't have English mm. at all um, is certainly one that we didn't put up there. Um, so we're going to encourage you. You have. Um, you should all see on the top of your screen um, a few options to, um, to to use a marker or a highlighter. So if you could just click on the little pen icon, you can put a tick mark next to any of these groups that are maybe particularly um, jumping out for you in terms of the populations that you work with or or that are living in areas where you're working that, that would be important to, to consider and and you're also welcome to write extra things on this list um, and we won't do a full count but we should be able to just get a sense of where the most <laughs> marks are as we can see it coming up here um, yeah. I know it's quite difficult to to write with your mouth so <laughs> oh I but, love it um, thank you for, for your effort We've got you can diverse. also type it in the chat box, right? It might be a little yeah, easier to type. That might that. be easier. <laughs> <laughs> diverse abilities, um, all, yeah, basically yeah. everything. This is really, and so to pick up on what, um, so just so people know, we're planning to do this a little bit organically because we kind of wanted to see what comes up. Um, and we recognize language is not there. There's quite a few things, actually, that aren't on yeah. this list. Um, and we this was not in any way intended to be um, a comprehensive list. This was to get the conversation started. So what we have missed, we, we're asking you, um, and some things we left out on purpose because we wanted to kind of see where people um, landed with their feedback. Um, and I wanted to comment on a couple of things that I see people are voting on. So, you know, one of the um, one of the things that I see a lot of people have checked is um, where people spend greater than thirty percent of their income on housing, and that is a that is a marker um, for in a lot of cases for uh, families that are vulnerable to. Um, inequities um, due to inadequate income. Um, you know, the interesting thing here is if you look then um, at the next two renters versus homeowners, um, you know, renters who spend more than 30% on their housing, um, I think are actually at greater risk than homeowners that spend greater than 30% of their housing. In a lot of cases with homeowners, um, there is some latitude to um, move to a situation that where that proportion of finance, you know, greater than 30% on housing could actually be decreased. Uh, we see more among renters that they don't have that um, 
um, that freedom yep. to um, just find another space because of the lack of availability. So, you know, there's there are deeper there are deeper lenses here, and I and I think the other point that I really wanted to make, and then I'll stop babbling, but <laughs> is that you know there's real intersection of um, social determinants. Um, within this list. So, you know, again, the issue of housing, you know, um, we, we, there is a direct, research has shown a direct link between um, housing and the level of food insecurity, for example, and you can get good information on that from the proof research body in, in Ontario. And, you know, if it, it shows that um, it, if a family um, lives in an owner-occupied dwelling, so if they own their home, they're actually at less risk of food insecurity than a renter, yes. And so, I mean, there's deeper layers to that as well. So I think that that's a really, it's just important to appreciate um, that there are more layers. And I see people have added refugees, transgenders to the entire LGBTQ community. Um, absolutely, people who are displaced, you know, we're entering into a project on um, uh, long-term evacuation and the role of public health to address the, the, the needs long-term after natural disasters. Um, people who are displaced in their communities repeatedly. So there's there's multiple layers. This is really helpful. <laughs> now I'll stop. It's, it's great to have such a list and there's a few more at being added to the chat box as well. Um, and one of the things that this says to me, um, aside from the specific issues unique to each of these different groups, is it really highlights the importance of that consultation piece and, and to point out yeah, that, that to use a health yeah, equity lens is not a one-size-fits-all um, approach mm -hmm. to planning. So, for you know, there are things that will work really well in one community that might actually cause problems in another community. So it's so important to know who's in that community and what their needs and, and desires are because they, they will differ. Um, from one place to another. Um, should we move? I think people are mostly Slow done down. marking this one up. Should we move on to the next? Yeah, I'd love to. And um, I could do that one, Karen. And um, just thank you, everybody, for this. So we're going to ask for some similar type of um, participation from you for the next question, so if I can get you to advance the slide. Um, the next discussion piece um, that we wanted to get your feedback on was about, um, oh, that, that's good. <laughs> um, We're having a little trouble but, there. No, that's okay. In what areas of the built environment um, have equity issues come up in your, when we say your area, in your work, in your geography? Um, and then it's sort of building on the previous one, you know, um, which groups have been most affected. So um, I, what we want to get a sense of here is where have people focused time um, and where have, what seems to be the, the driving concerns, I guess. So just, you know, know which, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry, I, go ahead. Oh, go, no, I'm good. Oh, uh, just because uh, the slides are kind of faint. Um, so top is, um, Neighborhood design and housing to the right. I think yeah, then food, <laughs> then food the systems and natural environments to the left of that, and then uh, finally the bus or train is the uh, transportation. Yeah, this is so interesting. <laughs> I think housing is getting like super highlighted there. <laughs> um, I like it's to draw a circle around the whole thing. I know. Oh, somebody is like writing multiple circles around food systems. That's really it's a spiral. That's really great. <laughs> um, it's interesting to me the healthy natural environments is getting seems to be getting a little less attention, um, or not attention, but just um, isn't quite doesn't quite seem to be the same level of focus. It seems to be transportation, housing, food. What do you think, Karen? Yeah, I'm wondering if it's if that's because um, it might be just different interpretations of of what that means, or it might be that. Yep. I think a lot of what happens around healthy built environments is preserving them, or you know, our healthy natural environments is preserving those natural spaces. Right. So it's a little less active, and so people might not be um, including it as much because they're not actually going out and changing those things to the same extent. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I would say that you know, included in that idea of healthy natural environments is you know, making sure there are 
trees nearby and and connected parks and and little things as well as as major spaces. Um, yeah. But but it is interesting to see that it you know. Yeah. I, I'm actually surprised to see so much around food because it's one that's. I think I've certainly heard that it's something that's very important for a lot of people, but a more difficult one to take action on. So um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. interesting to see that. Mm-hmm. Well, and I'm just reading a couple of comments because um, one person here has noted um, that, that natural environments piece has been incorporated within the healthy neighborhood design. So, you know, that speaks to um, what you said, Karen, that it may be how it's being interpreted. And, you know, someone else has commented that people are busier than ever just existing and surviving. And, you know, that that um, perception of having spare time to go out and enjoy your natural environment is not necessarily a priority. And, you know, that's, that's um, sobering. That's a sobering thought. Um, those of us who are privileged enough to say, hey, I'm going to, you know, go out and do whatever in my natural environment. Um, so that, you know, we're, we're privileged to be able to do that. I think, you know, then the lesson for me is that public health needs to intentionally consider those healthy natural environments within um, the other work to help make it more accessible. Those are, yeah, really, really good points. Really good points. Huh. Oh, this is really interesting. Thank you very much. Karen, do you want to go to the next one, do you think? Uh, Yeah, let's do the next one. Okay, sure. Yeah, just so try to change the slide. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, and, this and is this our, our third question, and then we'll go back to a more broad general discussion. Um, and this one, uh, we want to know, you know, same as same as the first one, you know, what are the sectors that you have worked yet with? And then we'd also like to hear who else you like to connect with that you you know maybe you haven't worked with them so far, but what additional sectors? And and again, this will be an incomplete list. Um, so we're interested to to know other groups that, um, that people are are working with, and I'm not sure if we have all of these groups actually reflected in our audience online today. Um, mm. If we do, but we're hoping that people can use this partly as an opportunity, you know, through the chat box that you know if you are. Um, a, working in public health and you're really wanting to connect with someone, you know, a, a developer or someone working in transportation that you can perhaps find each other um, through some of this. This is interesting too, hey? A school, that's an interesting one. Oh! Oh, I think no, I'd like... Writing escape design or landscapers or yeah. another, another important one. Yeah. I, I hadn't thought of schools. So I'd be interested to think about that. Um, I want to make it made a good comment just now as people are filling this in about broadening our understanding of what is meant by a natural environment um, and thinking about green space overall. That's especially important. And so, um, you know, and, and that effect of green space and blue space, right? And how those things are part of a natural environment. Um, and an inherent part of our everyday routines, not something that you just go out and enjoy, right? Exactly. You do, but <laughs> that's also just part of our normal way of living. Um, and, and I think another equity, that could be considered an equity issue related to that, um, is that, you know, again, that difference between single family dwellings where you might have a backyard or a front yard to have your own little patch of green space versus people who are living in denser urban environments or in high-rise apartment buildings where you do actually need to go out to access green space. And so there's certainly an equity issue there in terms of needing the time to do it and then whether or not you have a, a safe and attractive opportunity for that nearby. Yeah, yeah. Developers um, have come up in the chat box. Mm-hmm, a as landlords have as well. Times, a question about developers. Um, mm-hmm. in terms of engaging them. And, and I think that certainly, um, you know, from discussions that I've been a part of, is that is, I mean, people are always trying to bring developers into the conversation a little bit more um, because they are distinct from planners and local government. Um, and there was an earlier question that might make sense to to bring it up now about um, how to work with developers whose focus is on earning money because, 
you know, they are a business, and, and that's what they're yeah. in business to do. Um, and it's a difficult one. I think one there's there's um, I don't know if we have any developers um, on you know participating today, and I encourage you to, to weigh in. Um, one thing that I did hear brought up at one point was from a developer was that um, there are ways to kind of, and I'm using air quotes here, to sell some of these ideas that, you know, I think he said health was the new sustainability or something. So people want to live in, um, you know, healthy communities or they want to have these things. So incorporating some of these healthier elements into development could be seen as a selling feature. So that's one piece. I mean, that also then raises equity issues because do they cost more and, and, and are they accessible yeah. to everybody? Um, oh, but but I think healthy communities are desirable in general. So that's one piece. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, it's, it is a, it is a challenging piece and I'm, and I'll say one more comment and then I know we, um, I know we need to have to get back to a couple of questions, but I'm thinking, um, you know, public health, for example, because my brain is always in public health, um, may not work directly with developers, but public health may work with municipalities and city planners who then all work with developers um, or who work on the bylaws that determine maybe what developers can do. Um, there are spaces for influence there in a lot of cases. Um, and I'm thinking of a conversation that Karen and I had with a colleague yesterday, a friend of ours in, in Alberta, um, about um, some of the unintended um, negative <laughs> consequences that um, where the equity gap can actually be um, through healthy built environment initiatives. Um, so, you know, in the example where some um, areas, some, some swaths of city land might be cleared so that a rec center is built um, that is, you know, quote unquote available to everyone, um, and yet um, our lower income people, uh, for example, can't afford it or live too far away to be able to access it, don't have the transportation. Um, and some of that, you know, can some of that be mitigated um, through better relationships with developers um, to avoid some of those unintended consequences? So um, I'm not doing a very good job of relating that example clearly, um, but um, it's it's a consideration that, um, you know, as we think about healthy both environment work, um, we also need to, um, to consider our atypical partners that this question gets at, but also, um, you know, how do we avoid unintentionally increasing the gap, the equity-related gap? So anyway, I know we have about three minutes left, so should I ask Tina to, if there's a couple more questions for us to address? Sure. Um, so there was another one, um, and uh, I think maybe Diane would be able to, to answer this. Um, how does proportionate universalism fit with approaches you are suggesting as per the five principles from the linkages toolkit. Ah. <laughs> that's, that's a great great question. It's I think um and I don't know if this is the most eloquent way to answer the question. I think it's that um with with every area of focus. So if you're doing something within healthy transportation, if you're doing work on healthy neighborhood design, any of those five areas, um, Within that, it's always asking the question, what is the impact on our populations um, who experience marginalization, um, disadvantage, vulnerability? Um, how is this going to affect our low-income populations? How is this going to affect people that have inadequate housing? It's, it's always and continually asking those questions and then um, making um, plans, I'm losing my words a little bit, but um, addressing those concerns within any plans that are made. It's, um, it's similar to um, community engagement work that I'm, I'm supporting right now is um, always asking that with anything a public health agency organizes, how does this affect our um, most disadvantaged, most marginalized um, population? So it fits, that proportionate universalism fits from a planning perspective and um, 
and then adjusting um, what is done to address the inequities that exist. All right, for those of you on the phone, um, can you please mute your phone? Um, I'm going to try to mute from my end too, but okay. So, um, do you have anything to add to that, Karen? Um, or to move on to the next I think move on to another. Sure, okay. Um, let's see. Um, so, there's a question about spatial equity and the definition of uh, how that relates to blue and green spaces. Hmm. That's a new term yeah. for me. Well, it's a bit of a new term for me, but I, I bet you our um, we have a colleague, Emily Rugel, that's not a new term for her. <laughs> I don't know if Emily is on the line, if she can um, help with an answer there. I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to that one. Um, okay, and then next question. Um, do you know any examples of community, community benefit agreements being used by neighborhood associations to leverage enhancements to the built environment with private developers? Hmm. Um, offhand, I do not, but I can, um, that doesn't mean that we can't go looking, right? Um, you know, we, we do a lot of our knowledge translation work based on the case scenarios and the examples that we find out about. So that's something I would have to go looking for because it would be really, really good to find out. Okay, thanks, Diane. Um, so last question that I saw in the chat box, um, how do we prevent the development of hostile architecture such as spikes, discouraging seating, features that look nice but are functionally useless? Ah, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> I'll try to take a start and then I'll pass it back to Diane. Um, I think that, you know, I, my sense is that those things are used, you know, partly to maybe to deal a lot with safety issues or fears of, of safety issues. And, and I think probably it's a matter of, you know, there are other ways to, to encourage neighborhood safety. And, and one of the big ones that comes up in the research is, is this idea of eyes on the street. So, you know, designing neighborhoods and communities so that there are people are just naturally outside and present and around to see what's going on. And that also discourages some of the same kinds of behaviors like graffiti and vandalism that a lot of these, um, you know, hostile, I love this term, hostile architecture elements might be put in <laughs> to prevent. So that's that's one piece that I'll offer. I love that term too. Um, it's it, the challenge with that is is it's very subjective, right? Um, um, but you know, I think so. You know, my lens is public health practice, and it is you know the intersectoral partnerships. So um, you know, if there are hostile architectural um, uh, constructions that are happening that are um, contributing to some of the inequities, for me, it would be you know, is there a solution anywhere in the relationships built with um, city planners who then, um, you know, do the bylaws um, and who who help um, set the standards and the guidelines for what is able to be built in a city and in a community. Um, but that's that's about what I can offer. And I'm just going to thank um, Kendra, who just posted in the chat, to attribute that eyes on the street concept to Jane Jacobs, who is really one of the great gurus of this kind of work and, and her writing would probably have a lot more ideas and that's probably a good place to start. Yeah. Yep. And I think that then the last thing I'll say before we close is just that I know there are a lot of um, municipalities um, and there, I mean, various um, industries and organizations and um, who are doing health equity impact assessments um, or health impact assessments where, um, um, the, the, you know, at every decision point in a project, um, various questions and lenses are applied to consider what the health impacts or what the equity related impacts and that may be um, another strategy that could, could have an influence. Thank you, Diane and Karen. Um, so we are at the end of our webinar, um, unfortunately. There's been a lot of great discussions and very lively discussions from participants. 
Thank you very much. And um, I, I do encourage you to continue discussions on the NCCH Health People's Environment online forum. I will be posting the webinar, um, the webinar recording on the forum where you can continue discussions. And um, with that, thank you very much and uh, have a good day.